when I was in India, one of the rides to my hotel, one of the local brothers there talked to me about two more martyrs from their team, not giving the location, even a hint of the location. But I'd, I'd been in that region myself uh, a couple times over the years. And I'm talking about a tribal region. I'm talking about as you get close to it, monkeys in the trees. I'm talking about our first visit. We were told, do not go out from this little guest house in the evening because there's a man-eating tiger on the loose. Yeah, I, I kid you not. All right. That's how tribal and remote these areas were. And this area has now been blanketed by the gospel. The ministry we work with has sent workers out and they have blanketed this area with the gospel. But in the last year, two more of their pastors were killed. Two more. And I don't know what that brings the number to, but certainly over over five or six in recent years. And what's happened is there is increased hostility, increased hostility towards Christianity in India. You always have Hindu resistance. You, you have those that want to see India as a Hindu nation and look at Christianity as an intrusion, Islam as well. But you don't have a lot of Indians, from what I understand, uh, converting afresh to Islam. You just have the growing Muslim population. But you do have many Indians converting to Christianity on a regular basis. That's looked at as more of the threat. So the government under Prime Minister Modi is openly hostile. I've reached out to folks that I know in the Trump administration saying, please, can you present to them what's going on, how he wants to eradicate Christianity from India, how they're trying to get people who've converted to deconvert, even financial incentives to the poor and things like that. Uh, Just a strong push. But what's happened, not just that hostility, then you get the hostility from media that's in harmony with that. But then you also get the groups like RSS. Right now, the ruling party in India is the BJP, which is a Hindu nationalist party. Then you have groups like RSS, which are more militant Hindu activists, and they'll persecute Christians, and the police will just look the other way. In fact, i I got to tell you a story, India story, the moment we come back, you're not going to believe this. It's, every word is true, what I'm going to tell you. But uh, with the increased hostility, what's happening now is Christians are under more and more persecution, more and more pressure, and two of these precious believers killed within the last year. I'll tell you how that happened when we come back. When I'm in India, I'm not doing proselytizing. I'm meeting with friends there, spending some personal time doing important things behind the scenes. I'm not doing open proselytizing. We are not holding mass public meetings like we did years ago because the climate has changed. And, and so I'm, I'm not going over to, to do that. All right. Uh, but I just want to give you a picture of, of India. Amazing country, amazing in many ways and very, very different from America in many ways. November 27th, a woman, veterinarian, high caste woman, was raped and killed. It sent further shockwaves through the nation because rape happens there not just on a regular basis, but often the rapists are not punished, especially if it's a, a, a lower caste, an untouchable woman, no big deal. They can be raped and sometimes they then get killed because they got raped. Uh, Within the last few days, an untouchable woman who had been raped was on her way to court to testify against the rapists, and and a couple of the men who had raped her, along with others from the village, set her on fire, and she she died of her injuries the the next day. I mean, just just tragic. So same time, this veterinarian woman was raped, and uh, when she was raped, uh, outcry nationally over raped and killed, for good reason, outcry nationally. Untouchable woman raped, virtually no outcry. That's a shame. In any case, the four men were immediately apprehended. So a few mornings ago, uh, 3.30 in the morning, they were shot and killed by the police. I, so when I heard about it, I thought, well, firing squad? I mean, that, that quickly? November 27th, the thing happens that shortly after that they're arrested, and what, like a week later they're executed? Well, what happened was that the police, uh, here's the police version. In the middle of the night, so as not to draw a crowd during the day, they brought the four men to the site where they had allegedly killed and raped and killed and buried this woman. They had also buried some of her belongings. So they said, we want you to go there to reenact what happened, and then we want you to show where you buried some of the items and and dig them up. And for that reason, they were not handcuffed. And then the men, the four men, started to throw rocks at the police and then went to grab the guns of some of the police, 
So the police shot them dead. Now, everybody knows what happened. Everybody knows what happened. What happened was they executed the men. They found a pretense to execute them. I'm looking at headlines from India newspaper that was uh, uh, at my hotel. Justice executed. That's what it read. I'm talking about major political leaders saying good for them. I, I talked to one significant leader, and he said, good, sends a good example to others. Sends a good example. Uh, sets a good example. And sends a good message to others. There are, there are celebrities praying, good job, Hyderabad police. That's the way you do it. And apparently there are thousands of such cases every year. One of the policemen, uh, allegedly, this is the fourth time this has happened with someone that he's responsible for, that he brought them out of the prison or whatever, and then found an occasion to shoot them. Now, of course, there are others that are saying, this is not right. You can't just take justice into your own hands. And the problem is, what if the, somebody's innocent and there's just an uprising against them? But wild story, huh? Wild story. I, I asked, will any of the people that killed these pastors in these remote tribal regions, will they be prosecuted? And the brother was telling me about it, said, oh, no. I mean, this brother works with them, knows them well. He said, no. He said, the village turned against them. So what happened was, remember, a lot of the people in these villages, they live in small huts or something that would be very close to a hut. There's no running water in the house. You go to a well for your water. You can just, it's just room for you and your family, and basically that's it. So when you build a church building, even if it seats 20 or 30 people, that's a significant thing. And now more people can come and meet together. And it also sends a message uh, to, to the region. So two of the pastors were involved in the physical building of the church building when the villages rose up against them and killed them. And again, there's a lot of anti-Christian animus that is being stirred up. So what happened is, uh, I'm not sure exactly how, but the buildings were completed. And the wives are now caring for the flock. The wives are now shepherding the congregation. And I imagine at some point the ministry will try to get more workers there to, to help. But right now, that's what's happening. The wives are leading the, the church there, and their children are being cared for back at the home base uh, because there's not adequate uh, education there. Often diet is very poor. People get very sick, malnourished, die. So the, the kids... But a lot of these church planters, that's how their kids have to be raised. This is the best environment for them to get three healthy meals, getting a fine education, being with other Christian kids in that environment. But that's a sacrifice they make to go to these tribal regions. If you'd like to support one of these pastors in a tribal region, $50 per month does it. You say, well, what does that buy? I mean, it's $50. It doesn't buy much, right? Can, you know, you take your family to fast food. If you've got four or five kids, you know, what, what does $50 buy? Okay, no, fifty dollars fully supports them, meets all their needs. Mm -hmm. That's that's how tribal and remote these regions are. Fifty dollars a month. Uh, if you want to support one of the children at the children's home, it's a little bit less. But go to LNC, as in love and care, lncministries.org, lncministries.org, and then click on sponsorships. All right, and you can give there accordingly. But with the the martyrdom of these pastors being fresh in my mind. These are men we laid hands on. Then we laid hands on and sent them out, okay? We personally laid hands on them, sent them out. If you're looking at LNC Ministries, Love and Care Ministries, right on the top, across the top of the page, you'll see sponsorships. But uh, these are men that we laid hands on, that I personally laid hands on and commissioned, and we, and we send them out by life or by death to preach the gospel. And it's, it's real there, friends. Forget the American version of the gospel we're used to where we, we don't want to get unfriended on Facebook or a pastor's afraid to talk about something controversial for fear of losing a good tithing member. Now, these people go knowing it could well cost them their lives. It could well cost them their lives. And they go gladly, considering it a privilege to give their blood for Jesus. So I'm directly related to these martyrs, all right? No, I, I'm not the martyr. I prayed for them. I'm just saying I... I have a vested interest in the well-being of their families and the well-being of the ministry that they serve. But that news and then the, with the passing of evangelist Reinhard Bonnke, I, I just want to ask this question. Where are the evangelists in our midst? I know that every leader is called to do the work of evangelism, right? I, I understand that. Paul writes that to Timothy, even though he was a shepherd and, and a pastor, 
do the work of an evangelist. And the, the ultimate arm of evangelism is you and me, the local body, believers, reaching your family, your friends. The vast majority of people will come to faith through the witness of a family member, a friend, co-worker, all right? But there are those that God raises up and gifts and anoints as evangelists. And that's their focus. Souls, 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 souls. Steve Hill, used in the Brownsville Revival. That was his focus. The lost, the lost, the lost, the lost. And yeah, he wanted to see the people of God built up and strengthened, but reaching the lost and then equipping you. So evangelists also do that. Equipping the body to go and reach the lost. A critically, critically important calling. And, and a powerful gift it can be uncomfortable to be around evangelists because they're so focused on the loss. You did not want to invite Steve Hill to, to do your wedding or to speak at a funeral unless you wanted to have an altar call. That's, that was just the reality of it. I remember the one time he joined me in India, I think back in 2006, and we were at a hotel and we were being served a meal. It was all those that were involved in the meetings and we were being served a meal there. And, and Steve, okay, because we got all the staff there, the workers at the hotel, he wants to, he wants to preach to them. He, he wants to give an altar call. He wants to lead people to Jesus. That, that's just the focus. But friends, forever and ever and ever and ever, they're going to be people who should have perished, people who should have been lost and in hell, who are with Jesus forever because of your witness, because of the work of an evangelist, because of somebody reaching out. And that's what's going to matter forever, ever, ever. Who's with the Lord? Who's not? Who's saved? Who's lost? Who's blessed? Who's judged? That's what's going to matter. We need our eyes open to eternity, friends. We get so caught up with earthly things. And I'm still not getting caught up with the impeachment hearings. I told you from the start, I'm not going to get caught up in the daily frenzy. We'll step back as major things develop. Then we'll comment. Then we'll get involved. Or if I feel something significant the Lord lays on my heart, to comment on, then I will get involved, all right? But otherwise, otherwise, bottom line, bottom line, we got to keep our focus on things that are important to the Lord, and winning the lost must always be up there. That's God's heart, and that's the ultimate thing that matters forever is who's saved and who's lost. It's not just praying a prayer. It's not just being a convert. It's being a disciple. It's being a follower of Jesus, and we do have an impact in this world. How we live affects people in this world, but ultimately, bottom line, who's in, who's out, who's saved, who's lost? That's the bottom line. So friends, pray that God will raise up more evangelists. Every local church ideally should have someone who has a strong evangelistic gift and helps keep the church focused on reaching the lost, while the pastor, especially, unless the pastor is also an evangelist, especially going to uh, focus on meeting the needs of the flock and, and discipling and nurturing the flock, the evangelist is going to be constantly focused on the lost, the lost, the lost, and equipping you to help reach the lost. As Reinhard Bonnke has left this world, may God raise up many, many more, carrying the mantle of an evangelist, called by God with burning hearts to see the lost saved. May we see a great multiplication of evangelists. We need them preaching all over America. Small meetings, big meetings, all over America. The nation will be shaken as God raises up an army of evangelists. May it be so. Saints of the world.